those of you who don't know, I'm Naima Chowdhury. I'm one of the partners here at Tavishad Sutherland. And we've also got Shirley Hall, who we all heard this morning. Hi there. Um, we do have some slides in relation to this matter, but I think a lot of the things on the slides we have talked about in different guises with different speakers um, as the day's gone along. So we don't... I'll just mention that one. Yeah, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on, on these. And what we really want to do is get towards the discussion point and get that going. Um, but um, obviously we've seen, you know, that this is not an employer's problem and often it is you know, shown to be just an employer's problem, the gender pay gap. But actually, it's, it's very complicated, it's multifaceted, and there's so many different issues to it. Um, and a I, I, couple of things I wanted to add, you know, we, we talked about uh, Millicent Fawcett's um, statue going up, but actually in Manchester, we've had Emmeline Pankhurst's statue go up as well. And at first, I thought I was losing the plot. I walked past it a short while ago, and I'm thinking, I've lived here for about 20 years. I've not noticed this before. <laughs> How have I not noticed it? it? It was fine. It was a new one. So, you know, in the, in the north, we have something too. Mm. And the second one was a, a, a press headline, um, which is about girls going on the stock exchange. And this isn't made up. This is actually uh, a clipping from the Daily Express from 1941. Yeah, it was, um, it was actually sent to me by a colleague who was reframing a picture and they took out the back of the picture and it had been padded with newspaper and it just so happened that this was actually the cutting from the back of the newspaper. Um, so she sent it to say, look at this. And it was, the way it was written was with some shock that, you know, women were actually being allowed on the stock exchange. And, and the drift of it was that, um, who the knows, they the could even... Take the boys' jobs. They could even t start taking the boys' jobs, you know. <laughs> so it was, um, it was very timely finding of uh, a, a relevant newspaper <laughs> cutting. And I think the, the other issue is this is not just a problem that we are grappling with. This is a global issue and, and, you know, different countries are at different stages of the journey. And some of you may have been looking at, you know, Ireland's looking at introducing um, the gender pay gap regulations and actually theirs are going to be a lot more stringent than the ones that we have in force. So those of you who have global ro ro roles, you know, um, have the challenges of get into grips with different legislation in different countries. And yet when you come to report, there's an element of, the, you know, your employees not necessarily caring what the differences are. They want to know what the issues are globally. So, you know, some of our global clients have reported in accordance with the UK statistics that are required, but then in their narratives have talked about what they are doing and where their journey is globally, because that's what employees actually want to see. So this is just looking very briefly at um, why employers should be, oh, some of my, oh, there it is, sort of lost one of my uh, shapes there. So why should employers actually be um, uh, acting on, on you know, the gender pay gap? Why should you be putting together so, something? Well, there's a whole host of issues and I'm not going to go into all of them, but one I think is really worth highlighting is the fact that women drive 70% of household purchases in Europe. And actually, for businesses, it you know that is very, very strong buying power. So there's going to be increasing both consumer, client and investor pressures in relation to making sure that the gender pay gap is being closed. And investors in particular are asking questions and, and some are saying, well, we are not actually going to invest in this organisation because it's gender diversity at board level or whatever is insufficient. So there's going to be other external pressures. It's not just the legal stick that you have waving over you. There's a whole host of multifaceted issues that are going to put pressure on organisations to, to think about you know, closing your gender pay gap. And, you know, the, the, the economics of it just, you know, it's a non-starter. We've seen all seen the McKinsey report that is saying that, you know, businesses that are more gender diverse are 22% more profitable. And actually, those businesses that um, are ethnically diverse are actually 33%. Uh, more profitable. So, you know, I, I'm not a mathematician, but it seems to me that it just makes no sense for not for this not to actually be um, taken further. So, Shirley, do you just want to talk a bit about the action planning? Yeah, 
Of course, we, we've talked quite a lot today about different things that we can take in order to um, close the gender pay gap and identifying the, the various risks and pressures associated with it. So it, it's really looking at the causes and considering what's driving, as I said this morning, it's not a one-size-fits-all. It will very much vary with your organisation, how it's structured, what the makeup is, what the representation is. But the key thing is to kind of think about what is really causing it. Is it the education pipeline? Is it the talent pipeline? Is it progression once they're in employment? Um, it's all sorts of facets, but you need to understand what really is the underlying cause within, within your organisation. And of course... You know, we do have a pressure on resources. We can't do everything all at once. So the important thing is to prioritise and uh, think about what's, what is going to achieve the biggest return on kind of your resources because you can't do everything at the same time. And then action planning. And we, we talked in the session this morning about action planning for equal pay. This is less litigation at first, more kind of, you know, how do you actually close the gap? What kind of initiatives can you join? Um, is the sector initiatives, are there things that you can do with schools? So, for example, as, as a firm, we're doing lots of school initiatives. Mm. We do things from various aspects. So one of our key things is uh, social mobility and working with um, you know, uh, individuals whose you know, um, parents and guardians haven't gone to university, for example. So it's, it's not just necessarily one stream, mm. it's, it's lots of different yeah. streams can kind of open well, up. Well, as Shirley's talking about our Unlocked programme, which is where we're getting in, you know, young people who um, are very gifted but come from socially disadvantaged backgrounds. So, you know, um, th th their parents may be, the, you know, they may be the first generation in their families to go to university. But we're getting in there early, giving them some experience of what work in a law firm is like, some of the um, you know, presentation skills, some of the things that they're going to be challenged with, financial awareness, you know, commerciality. And, and with some of them, you know, we actually support them through university and, and, and help them towards the financial cost of it. Uh, and they will keep in touch you know they have a mentor that's a, a partner that we follow through and you know my um, I've had a, um, a, a mentee who has been with us through university she graduated with a 2-1 and did teach first for two years and now she's actually come back to apply to us for a training contract and it's when you see those types of journeys uh, yeah, and, the, and it, you know, it's very satisfying as a mentor to see somebody growing through that journey and developing as an individual and the changes. So there's lots of different things that you can do. And I think, you know, one of the things is, Shirley said, it's about prioritising. And I think it's great, you know, if you're in your action plan, you can think about what your short-term goals are and maybe what your longer-term goals are. Because I think if people can see that you're thinking about it, that's where they're going to think, yeah, this organisation mm. is, is, you know, deeply committed to, to this. It's not making promises of everything, but it's saying in the short term, you know, we are going to be looking at this and we're going to be looking at that. And, and don't be afraid that when you come to report on your figures for mm. the April that just finished, and just in case you're any one of those, but 152 people have already reported on their figures for April 2018. Mm. Um, yeah. I went onto the website yet last week to have a look, um, but you know, it, don't be afraid if when you come to re report on those figures, you you have to say, we thought our priorities were going to be A, B, and C, but having worked on it for a year, we don't actually think that A is an issue or actually A is lower down the agenda. So this year, we're actually going to focus a bit more on C. Mm. You know, you don't have to just follow something through if actually time evolves and shows that things have moved on in the business. I think that's right, and I think a lot of this is about breaking down barriers, and so thinking about how you can break down those barriers. So the schemes we've we've talked about kind of break down the stereotyping perceptions often that, that school age and, and university graduates have about our business, about an, an international law firm. So that's we're finding that that's actually helping to break down those barriers. We've also been talking to a number of clients about um, taster days for recruitment where. For example, they've got engineering roles that might, you know, not necessarily women might not always think about. So what they're doing is taster days, come in, have a look, you know, chat to, to engineers and things like that. 
and working with schools to, to mm. do those little taster things so that you're breaking down those kind of stereotypes and, and assumptions and presumptions about occupations, really starting at the kind of grassroots, grassroots level. So I think yeah. it's thinking about are there any barriers to, to progression uh, and to closing the pay gap within your organisation? If so, what kind of things can I think about? And it's surprising that a lot of employers out there are very happy to share their, their experiences. Yeah. And I think the other thing is having the, the right data for you to be able to understand yeah. where to target. Because it's all very well saying, well, we're going to increase the number here and we're going to get people in. But are you able to actually you know, maintain those individuals through your, you know, the, their careers so that they are progressing, you know, is it that actually you are able to retain people, but you're then losing them to further, mm. you know, so do you need to look at, you know, your promotion, what are the issues in relation to pro promotion, where can you support further, but you can only put the action plan together, in my view, if you have better data than just the six yeah figures that we're looking at reported in relation to gender pay because until you can get under the skin of your business you're not really going to understand what your fundamental issues are this is not just about getting you know more and more women onto boards we've seen already it's very easy for uh, organizations to say yes we've met the davis target but actually when you look at behind the numbers the number of women that are actually an executive level on boards is very low because the numbers are being massaged by having non-executive and actually sometimes it's the same non-exec so we're in different you know two or three different companies so you've got to mm. really get underneath your data to put together your action plan as yeah. to what is going to get you the best results yeah and it was said in the last session less focus on statistics and numbers and more upon the culture of the organization and what you're actually trying to achieve culturally yeah like, sure yeah yep so this was really just a summary of things we've talked about, analysing the causes. And, you know, we recognise throughout the day that not all of this is in your control, because a lot of it is, is embedded in societal and cultural issues. But to think about what is within your control and what you can actually change. Um, I talked very early on this morning about um, confusing gender pay and equal pay. And it's making sure that your stakeholders in particular are clear on, on, on what each of those mean. Uh, thinking about action planning. And don't uh, over get, get overwhelmed about the potential action. As I said before, you can't do everything all at once. And it's unrealistic to put yourself under that kind of pressure. So think about how you can prioritise. What's going to get you the biggest return with a view to changing the kind of culture and the, the way you approach it? And learn lessons from um, other annual reporting. I found, maybe this because I'm a te techie lawyer, but I actually found a lot of the narratives really interesting mm -hmm. when you click through from the government website. Yeah. The different approaches, some of the different initiatives. There's some great initiatives mm -hmm. in there when you are, uh, particularly in some of the, the kind of STEM subject type yeah. occupations, what, what organisations are doing. So you, there's a wealth of information out there. Use it apply it to your business if it's relevant um, or adapt it if, if, if that's necessary. Um, we had a discussion, didn't we, earlier uh, on our little table about whether or not we expect the same kind of pressure on the media to be next year. And yeah, I'm, I'm not sure it will be because I think it's going to be le less newsworthy maybe next year. Yeah, but, yeah. I, I think there will be an element though of people, uh, the press monitoring certain organisations yeah. and saying, well, actually in yeah. 2017 or 18 they said this and here we are three years yeah. down the line and, still and you still haven't done X, Y or Z. Yeah. So, and, and as it says right at the beginning, this is the beginning, <coughs> it's not the end. And I think that's really important because we're looking at gender here and increasingly, you know, we will have, you know, wider duties, I believe. And I think we will have to start reporting on, you know, the race pay figure and potentially the, the disability uh, pay gap. Mm. I know that the government is looking at this um, and they're looking to see how to do it because actually it is difficult you can't just take the model from gender pay and apply yeah. it to race because there's so many different subtleties within race and and i think there's a big issue with race because organizations often don't have the same data because people are less willing to you know share their data and then we've got data 
pr um, protection issues. But I, I think, you know, don't think that this is it. I think it will widen and I think it will go towards more of the protected characteristics. Um, <coughs> and I would anticipate that race will be the next one and then potentially disability yeah. further up the line. So this is just the start and it's not the end of the, uh, uh, of the journey. So do be aware of that. And, and it's probably quite sensible that you start advising your businesses of that so you can look at ways in which you can you know if you've already got for example BAME networks and things how can you be looking at you know improving your profile and, and your statistics before you actually have to mm. uh, report on a mandatory basis I mean there's a discussion at the moment as to whether it should be voluntary and not mandatory but we also from gender pay that you know the voluntary approach didn't work and it had to be the the mandatory approach that actually resulted in, in, in businesses taking action. And the fact that the sign-off had to be by somebody senior in the business yeah. suddenly put it very much higher on the agenda. Because, you know, all studies show that if initiatives to improve gender diversity or any form of diversity and inclusion succeed, it's when you have the buy-in from the top. And that's when it works. So, you know, you need that buy-in because you can, you know, as HR professionals or whoever, you can be trying to do the best, but if you haven't got the support, there's only limited amount of stuff that you can do. So this is your opportunity to, you know, raise the profile yet further.